Thank you for tuning in and for demonstrating an interest in spiritual things. I apologize for not uploading in several weeks here and I hope to do better on that going forward but I'm so glad that you're interested in spiritual things and that is our goal here always to talk about the things of God the things of his word and I'm happy that you want to look into these things with us let's begin with a word of prayer holy God you are good and wonderful we praise you, Father, and we thank you for giving us your word. As we look into your word, our God, we pray that we will see the lessons that you are teaching to us, that we will take these things and apply them to our lives, that we might look more as you have given us to look. We thank you, our God, that you are the God that you are. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that you have poured out and given us the opportunity to accept. We, we praise you in all the things that you do, Father, and we pray that your will be done in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to talk about today is this thought of Adam or Christ. Paul sets up a contrast of what came with Adam and what came with Christ in Romans 5 and verses 12 through 21. And I want to begin by reading this text. In Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, <clears throat> Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the... Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." As much as I would like getting into this text and, and really going through it, not even verse by verse, but phrase by phrase and truly digging into what Paul is presenting here, I don't think that I would have enough time to present this text in that way. But I do want to talk about the gist of this text, what Paul is pointing toward, and I want to address some things that get get applied using this text that don't fit with scripture, does not fit with the message that God presents. And I want to show you inside of this text that it is not fitting with what God says. And I want to get into some application when we get into an understanding of what Paul is driving us toward here, that we can make some application, that we can think on how this does affect our life. But as we get into the misapplication of this text, perhaps you've heard a phrase, 
like original sin or total depravity. And when you get into some of these phrasings and you ask someone what these terms mean, depending on who you ask, they may give you a slightly different answer. Some will tell you that original sin is this concept in which you are born with Adam's sin, that because Adam sinned and you are his his descendant, that this sin has come down through the centuries and we are born with the sin that Adam committed. But the doctrine that we want to address, which comes from this, this Calvinistic tenet, they speak of it in a slightly different way. It's They don't say necessarily, some Calvinists may, but they don't say necessarily that we are born with the sin that Adam committed. Rather, because Adam sinned and through him death was brought into the world, that since he sinned, we're born with this fallen nature. And since we're born with a fallen nature, we are unable to not sin. Because we are born with this nature, we must therefore sin. We're born with the nature of a sinner because of Adam's sin and must therefore sin. J.I. Packer worded it this way, the assertion of original sin makes the point that we are not sinners because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners born with a nature enslaved to sin. And so as we are addressing this concept of original sin, addressing this concept of total depravity, which is this idea that we are completely and totally depraved because we've been born with this sinful nature that we cannot act upon God's good will until God first acts upon us. And so we want to deal with this concept inside of this text. Now, as we just read it, I think you can see why this text gets used for this purpose. But I want to look at just a few snippets to help us to see this going on. When you look at some of the phrases in here, just as sin came into the world through one man, for if many died through one man's trespass, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, therefore as one trespass led to the con or led to condemnation of all men, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners. And so you look at phrases like that as they appear throughout this text, and you can see it happening in so many of the verses. These phrases are looked at as this concept that because Adam sinned, then through that one sin, I became a sinner. I have inherited that, that fallen nature. I have inherited that depravity so that then I am a sinner. And as J.I. Packer said, I sin because I have this nature. And so when you look at these snippets, it does look like Paul is saying that. But I want us to note a couple of things that happen inside of this text that must render this untrue. As we think about some problems for this doctrine inside of this text, I want you to look at verse 12 again. In chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul wrote, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, I want you to notice where responsibility is laid here. Responsibility is not laid upon Adam. And some try to claim inside of this verse that responsibility is laid upon Adam. They insert two little words right at the end of this verse that says, in Adam. They say, death spread to all men because all sinned in Adam. They inherited Adam's sin and that's why they sinned. That is not what the text 
says. The text says that I am responsible for my choice, not Adam. Adam is not responsible for my nature. I am responsible for my choice. Why does death spread to all men? Because all sin. Death spreads to me because I sin. I'm responsible for my choice. You see, this puts this false doctrine puts the responsibility upon Adam. It's his fault because he sinned. My nature is such that I just could not help it. It's very reminiscent of what Adam said back in the garden when God asked him about eating the fruit that he commanded him to not eat. He looks at Eve, the woman that you gave me, gave me of the fruit and I ate. And so we see that argument very similarly made. The man God you put into the garden, he sinned and he gave me the this nature. That's not where the responsibility lies. The responsibility lies in my choice, not Adam for my nature. But perhaps an even better argument than that, one that can be seen even more clearly if you will look in verse 18, which says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. I want you to notice the implication. If this doctrine as presented by Calvinist of original sin is true, it says that I am a sinner with the nature of a sinner because of Adam's sin. And if that is true, then, because of Adam's trespass, I'm condemned. Then, because of what Jesus Christ did, because of his act of righteousness, I am justified and I am alive. And if that's true of Adam for all people everywhere, then that is true of Jesus Christ for all people everywhere, which is universal salvation. It is that no one is going to be lost because Jesus Christ came. He died for every single one of them. And the effect of that gift when God offers it is laid upon all people everywhere. Which then takes some other very clear scripture. You get into Matthew 25 and you begin reading in about verse 31. You get into Romans chapter 2 and you begin reading about judgment that is going to be brought upon those who do not obey, who do not submit themselves to God. Universal salvation is not a biblical teaching, yet original sin, if we want to read that into this passage, makes universal salvation, it's a... A conclusion that we are forced to reach, we have to, to read verse 18 as universal salvation if we read verses 12 through 21 as being original sin, as being total depravity. If I'm a sinner because of Adam, then I'm righteous because of Jesus and God will save me because of that righteousness. True of all people everywhere. And that's simply not a, a biblical teaching that all people everywhere are made righteous by Jesus. We're going to see as we get into the lesson that that righteousness is, it must be accepted by our obedience toward God. And so as we set this aside, let's talk about the gist of this passage. What is this text about? It is about the choice that we make. We can, excuse me, we can choose to follow Adam and we can take part in the result of following Adam. I, I can choose to sin even as Adam sinned and I take part in the result of that choice. His sin brought death into the world and when I take part in that sin, I choose death. His sin brought condemnation into the world, and when I choose sin, I choose condemnation. If I choose to live as Adam lived, then I choose to take part in the result of his choice, death and condemnation. 
But if I choose to live as Christ, then I choose to take part in the result of his choice. I get to take part in grace. I get to take part in justification and righteousness. Rather than death, I get to take part in life. And that's what Paul is driving toward in this passage. And I hope to show you that he carries this concept that when you choose the path of Christ, he carries it right into chapter 6, that there are some implications that come with it. But this is about the choice that we make when we live as Adam or Christ. And so you see my title in this. When we choose to live as Adam, when we choose to follow Adam, we look at the fall of man. Let's go back to Genesis 3 where we see Adam's footsteps here looking at mankind's fall uh, away from life and away from God. In the beginning, mankind heard error. First, they heard truth, where God presented them with a message of truth. They are not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God presented truth to them. But then mankind heard error. If you look in Genesis 3 and verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so God tells them in truth what the result of their action is going to be. You will die. And Satan steps in with a message of error, a message against God. You will not surely die. If you eat of the tree, you're just going to be like God and God knows it. And so he doesn't want you to eat of it. And man heard that error. He, he accepted that error and he obeyed the error rather than obeying God. He obeyed the error and disobeyed God. Look in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And so now sin has entered into the world. This was previously a world without sin. It was a world in which God's law was not broken, but man breaks God's law and sin enters into this world that God has created because they accept this error, they accept this false teaching, and they obey the error. They don't recognize it as false and turn away from it. They don't recognize that it is a temptation to turn from God, and they're not going to turn from God and and so they turn away from the error. No, they accept the error. They obey the error. They disobey God. And this brings sin into the world. And then using this death comes into the world. This sin, this disobedience brought death into the world as mankind is kicked out of the garden and his access to the tree of life is removed from him. If you get into chapter 3 and look at verses 22 beginning, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so death has come into the world as mankind is kicked out of the garden. Physical death certainly here in Genesis as well as spiritual death. And Paul builds upon that and he is discussing spiritual death over in Romans 5 as he uses this imagery here back from Genesis 3 that in Adam's 
action. Sin was brought into the world, and with sin being brought into the world, death is brought into the world. And so he draws back on that in Romans 5, and he says, when you take part in the sin, it was previously not in the world. Adam brought it into the world, and when you take part in that sin that he brought into the world, then you take part in death. From that sin, there is death. That is the wages of sin. That is what sin brings in. It brings death. And it is true that at some point in time, we all follow in the footsteps of Adam and take part in sin. If we take part in sin, we take part in death that comes with sin. We take part in the sin and death that came into the world through him. In Romans 3 and verse 23, Paul wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. At some point, when we become accountable for our actions, we follow in Adam's footsteps. We choose sin. Not because our nature is so totally depraved that we cannot choose to do the right thing. Not because we have inherited the nature of a sinner from Adam so that we cannot choose to do the right thing. But because in that moment, that is the choice we made. At some point, we all follow in his footsteps. We take part in sin. We take part in the death that comes with it. We followed Adam, and we fall away from God, in which we lose access to life, in which we die, Romans 5, 12, death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. What do we do about that? How, how do we take care of death? How do we overcome death and enter into life? We make a different choice. We stop following Adam and we start following Christ. When we follow Christ, we can make a return to God. Just as there was error declared in the beginning there that brought about the fall, we see that there is truth proclaimed by those that Christ sent forth. Look with me in the Gospel of John. Let's look in John 16 as Jesus is talking to those that he is sending forward with his message. If you look in John 16 and verse 13, we learn concerning the message that they are going to be speaking that they're told, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the thing that are to come. He says this right after telling them he has many things to say to them, but they can't bear them right now. When the Spirit is sent upon them, that they're going to receive these truths. If you look over in 17, looking in verse 14, Jesus says of them, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And so these men have become recipients of God's word. They have become recipients of the truth. And then if you look in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The Father sent the Son into this world with his message, with his word. Jesus did not speak of his own authority. He spoke with the authority that the Father gave him. Jesus takes this message and he gives it to these men and he sends them forward with this message. This message of truth, message that the truth, the message has been proclaimed by those that Christ sent forward. And just as error was heard, error was believed, error was accepted, and error was obeyed, we must do this with truth. We must reject 
the error, turn our backs on the error. We must accept the truth, this message that is presented to us. We must believe the truth and we must obey the truth. Let's look in Romans 10. In Romans 10, I want to begin in verse 13. Romans 10 and verse 13 we read, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And so as we follow this, sequence that Paul presents here. You have men who are sent out who are preaching the gospel. Here these men are miraculously sent. He's speaking to those who are sent forward by God as proclaimers of this message. And so they're sent out and they're making the gospel known so that people can hear it and hearing it so that they can believe it so that they can call on the name of the Lord. Well, what do you mean call on the name of the Lord? Well, he ended it with obey the gospel. We must believe this message that is presented, this message of truth, this message of God's word and obey it. Present ourselves in obedience to this message. The truth must be heard, believed, and obeyed. This message that God sends forward calling man who has run away from him, calling man who has turned their backs on him, calling man who has broken his law and sinned to come back to him. This message must be heard. It must be believed, but not merely believed as fact. It must be accepted as fact, and because it is accepted as fact, it must be obeyed, and if we will obey, this leads to salvation, it leads to life, and it leads to justification. Because of Jesus Christ obedience. Because of his submission to the Father, we have access to salvation. We have access to life. And we have justification. We are justified in the eyes of God. When we follow in Christ's footsteps and we obey and when we obey him, he saves us. If we look in Hebrews chapter 5, in verse 9, hold your finger in Romans. We're going to come right back to Romans and look in several places here. But look in Hebrews 5 and verse number 9 where we read, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Look at the verse before in verse 8. Although he was a son... He learned obedience through what he suffered. And so we see the suffering of Christ. We see the obedience of Christ. We see him submitting himself to the Father and he became perfect. He became the one who could be the source of salvation. It was through his one righteous act that he was able to be this through his obedience. And when we follow in his footsteps, he becomes the source of salvation to us. When we obey him, we receive life. We receive justification. When we make the choice to follow him, what do we do about having decided in the past to follow Adam, having decided to sin? When we make the choice to follow Christ, God's grace is abundant enough to cover up our sins. Look with me in Romans 5 again. Let's look at verse 17. Romans 5 and verse 17 where we read, 
For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Grace superabounded. Grace is enough to cover the sin. Grace is enough to remove the sin. Where are these sins removed? Well, if you carry it into chapter 6 and you look at verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, we skip verses 1 and 2 because we're going to look at them in the next and last point. But I want you to look in verses 1 and 2 right now and see this. When he's talking about dying, he's talking about dying to sin. He's talking about sin being removed from us. When we make the choice to follow Christ, when we make the choice to walk in his footsteps, we choose to die. We choose to be buried and we choose to be resurrected. That occurs in baptism. That is our following in Christ's footsteps. That is where we die to sin. That is where our sins are removed from us. This is God's grace. Our action to accept God's grace does not eliminate God's grace. God offers this grace to all. And it is those who accept his grace on the terms that he has offered it that, that receive the benefits of it. And it is enough to cover our sins. When we choose to follow Christ, we can have our sins forgiven. That occurs in baptism. And then we keep following Christ. Then we continue looking like Christ. It is not that our sins are covered and then we decide, well, God's grace is so great and wonderful that I'm just going to keep the, this whole sinning thing going on so I can keep showing off his grace that is there to forgive me. Paul tells us, no, it must not be this way. We're following Christ. We must continue in his footsteps. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We followed in Christ's footsteps. We have died to sin. We died to that in baptism. And so how can we who died to sin still continue in it? We have to look like Jesus, verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Jesus Christ died and then he was raised up never to die again. He was alive to God. And Paul takes this imagery and he applies it to us. In baptism, we entered his death. In baptism, we died to sin and we were raised up into new life. And now we are alive to God. We cannot go back to death. We must continue to live like Jesus. Continue to be alive to God. Continue to use our lives in service to God. We want to follow Christ, present ourselves as obedient slaves to God, to righteousness, which leads to life. Verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, 
either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And so I want you to notice inside of this verse that he sets up the same contrast that we said he was pointing to back in chapter 5. You see, in chapter 5, he talks about going down the path of Adam, and he's talking about presenting yourself, that personal choice, as a slave to sin and taking part in the death that comes with it. Or... You can decide to follow the path of Christ. You can present yourself as a slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. You can follow Christ. You can be obedient like Christ was obedient, which ends in the righteousness that Jesus Christ offers. Verse 17, these Romans have done this. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Jumping to verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When you decided to follow Adam, when you were a slave of sin, there was no righteousness in the picture. You were free of righteousness. You were full of unrighteousness, full of death. But now, verse 22, that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Now that you've decided to follow Christ, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we follow Christ, when we accept Christ, when we hear his message, we believe his message, we obey his message, the free gift of God, not a gift we earn, but the gift God gives when we obey him. The gift of God is eternal life. Leaving us with one question. Are you following Christ? 